Okay, we're gonna get started. Um, we've got a full room and I see lots of uh, familiar names and uh, lots of uh, really interesting details about where people are from. We've got Istanbul in the room. Wow, thank you for joining us. Um, we've got New York, hello Ari. We've, we've got Boston, hello Woody. We've got Utah. Um, so welcome everyone. It's uh, really great that we're uh, able to um, meet together for this really exciting event uh, for Click. So I'm going to just jump in with an introduction and say, hello, my name is Tony. I am in Boston. I am the Managing Director at the Center for Law, Innovation and Creativity, who is hosting this event. Um, this event is called the New Digital Divide, and it's part of a, a three-part series, actually, um, that focuses on um, IP and tech. And our theme this year looks at the ways that uh, tech companies and the lack of regulation seems to have created a new type of divide where um, for a long time the argument um, has been that we need accessible or, or we need uh, equitable access rather to technology and now we're living in a time where technology is accessing us. So if we think about contact tracing, if we think about the triangulation of social media data, um, you know, pinging our phones to, you know, for geolocation um, features, um, we're, we're we're entering this, um, or have already entered this, this new and really interesting time about um, what it means to live in the digital world today. So that is the theme that informs um, and has shaped our theme, um, or, or shaped our series for the, uh, um, for this academic year. And we are happy that are delighted to be joined by our first speaker, um, who is, I'm sorry, I'm a little distracted because a ton of notifications are going off and I try to turn them all off. Um, so I'm gonna stop pretending like I don't hear them. I'm just like, shh, <laughs> right now. Um, so anyways, uh, I'm delighted to be, we're delighted to be joined by our, our first speaker. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Professor Woody Hartzog, who is a faculty member at Click or at the Northeastern University School of Law, of which um, Click is, uh, where Click is housed to introduce our speaker. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to see you all on here. Um, it's a, a joy that uh, even in these times we can still get together. Uh, my job is to introduce uh, one of my dearest friends in the world, Ryan Palo. Uh, on paper, I'm going to put Ryan's bio in the chat because you can read uh, a lot of the accolades uh, that Ryan has. Ryan is the Lane Powell and D. Wayne Gittinger. Did I pronounce that right, Ryan? Uh, associate Professor at the University of Washington School of Law. Um, that's his title. You can learn a lot from him. Uh, Ryan is an absolute leader in several fields, so much so that it's difficult to summarize. Uh, he wrote some pivotal privacy uh, law scholarship uh, on things like privacy harms, things on uh, online manipulation, which many of us routinely cite uh, on, with almost every article that we write. Uh, Ryan has led the way on robotics and artificial intelligence law and policy scholarship, writing some key articles on drones uh, and bots and free speech. Um, he is also working on a hotly anticipated book about law and the field of law and technology generally, um, which I highly uh, commend to all of you to keep an eye out for when it comes out. Um, uh, Ryan's the co-director uh, of the Multidisciplinary Tech Policy Lab and the co-founder of it as well. Uh, someone that's done an incredible amount of work and I highly um, uh, commend you to, to, look at it, to look at that. He also is the co-founder for the We Robot Conference with Michael Frunken and our dearly departed friend, Ian Kerr, um, uh, which is the premier conference for uh, law and uh, robotics and artificial intelligence discussions uh, in the United States. And if I may be so bold, Ryan, the world, um, <laughs> and maybe or maybe not, but um, there's a lot of things that I could say about Ryan with respect to all of this. Um, and uh, suffice it to say, he is on the vanguard of these issues. Um, I could also tell you about some of the personal relationships um, that Ryan has formed, not only with many senior scholars in the field, but the incredible job that he does uh, working with junior scholars and being an incredible mentor and a guide for everyone in this area. Someone that I'm uh, uh, eternally grateful um, to know and have in our community. 
Um, I could tell you about the time that he and I skipped out on a major conference to go see the movie Her uh, in New York City in the middle of a blizzard because it was probably relevant to artificial intelligence and the law and policy. Um, or the time that we stayed out so late and we robot that we missed the whole first part of the next conference. But I'm not going to tell you about those times. But I am going to tell you about one story that might embarrass Ryan just a little bit. And he doesn't, I don't even know if he knows this story. So at one We Robot conference, we had adjourned for the evening and we were all sitting at a, uh, a, a restaurant outside and Ryan was sort of holding court with some of the junior scholars that were new to We Robot. And as he always does, he was being insightful and witty and warm. And, uh, and welcoming and everyone was having a good time. And then Ryan excused himself. I think he went to, to uh, the bar to, to uh, maybe grab another drink or something to eat. And I was in earshot of these two junior scholars and they turned to each other and audibly said, can you believe we are talking to Ryan Kahlo? <laughs> and I don't know if I ever told him that or not, but um, it captured the kind of uh, enthusiasm that Ryan brings and the importance of his scholarship. Um, as someone that, that I consider to be a, a leading light in our field. And so um, can you all believe that we are getting to hear Ryan Kahlo? Welcome to Northeastern University virtually. Thank you very much, Ryan. Wow, thank you. Um, that, uh, that has to be maybe the, uh, the a warmest introduction that I <laughs> that maybe I've I've had, um, and I really appreciate it uh, very very much, Woody. You know, I I right back at you. I mean, um, you know, you've you've been an inspiration, and um, so a couple of quick things. So first of all, um, we robot the conference that um, Woody mentioned is actually happening virtually this week. And so there's going to be like a launch event, and then you're going to be able to see um, some of the um, uh, pre-recorded but really lively and and generative um, uh, sessions that we robot this week. So keep an eye out for that. They're they're the, the folks at um, Ottawa are, um, yeah. Thank you, Woody. Just put it in the in the chat. Um, the other thing I would say is that you know speaking of Ian, who um, who Woody mentioned, um, you know Ian uh, was really the model. Um, for, for at least at least for me and I think for many many people in terms of how to engage with um, the community as a whole junior and 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 peer and the like um, he was just was such a, a warm and intellectually generous and just engaging person um, and so um, you know those of us who were, who were lucky to know him well um, benefited hugely from his uh, mentoring and his example um, that, that was quite a, a, a deep loss. Um, uh, among others, by the way, Ari, another example of that uh, would be uh, Joel uh, Reidenberg at, at Fordham. I mean, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's been a time of, um, of great loss uh, in, in, recent, in recent years. Um, so I am, I am so excited to, to, to give a lecture today um, at, at Northeastern um, and at Click. And I got to say that you know, um, Northeastern, in my view, is is doing it right. Um, and so, as Woody alluded to, I'm in the middle of researching um, a book about law and technology and sort of how do fields come to be formed, what are best practices, and and the like. Um, and in my view, Northeastern is doing the exact right thing. So, first of all. Um, you know, one of the things that I've learned over the last you know decade or so has been that there are very few interesting questions out there that are capable of resolution by reference to any one discipline. And so increasingly you need to hold hands across disciplines. Maybe you have dual training, maybe you you just talk to folks who who are in other disciplines, you're looking at the other disciplines, and they are also in turn, looking to us as legal scholars. Um, and I think it's important that we both recognize the importance of holding hands across disciplines, um, but also that we as legal scholars make ourselves and our work known and available to folks in other disciplines who turns out are quite excited about it when they, when they are realize it. And so one of the things that Northeastern does so well is to sort of try to 
merge those two things institutionally through cross appointment, through hiring people with, with dual training, uh, through having programs like this one that are, that are deeply interdisciplinary. Um, the other thing I would say is that um, in the speaker series, I cannot recommend more that you would also uh, tune in to Kate Darling and Joan Donovan, who are just two absolutely leading lights in their respective fields, one in the social uh, aspects of robotics, um, she's also a huge IP scholar, but you know, let's let's just focus on the on the probably what her talk will be about, uh, and the other in the field of misinformation and disinformation. And I've gotten, um, I'm relatively new to this field. I, I've only been working in the field of disinformation and misinformation for maybe the past um, six months to a year. But I'm part of a new center at University of Washington, um, and I cannot tell you how important. Um, she her work is to that to that uh, to that set of inquiry about you know um, misinformation and disinformation and so on. Um, so I highly recommend that. Uh, so you're going to hear about <laughs> you're going to hear about social robots. You're going to hear about misinformation and like what's you know. And I'm going to talk to you about I'm going to talk to you about administrative law. I'm going to talk to you about <laughs> administrative law. Now, for the law students out there, there is a rumor that is circulating in law schools, that administrative law is boring. That is not a true, that is not true. That is fake news, all right? I mean, administrative law is super exciting. It's really, really interesting. And so you know, that is not a hard pitch anymore because of the way in which um, administrative agencies are coming to the fore due to politics right now, right? Um, you know, and so, for example, you know, whether it's like the faithless Department of Justice, you know, uh, which is full of, you know, in incredible um, prosecutors, um, uh, some of whom have been dear, dear friends of mine, just really uh, amazing people. But in the leadership right now, it's just, you know, it's just in, in front of us because it's just so faithless at the moment um, uh, to the manufactured uh, uh, incompetence of the U.S. Postal Service, which has been doing nothing but like, you know, making money and like, you know, connecting us and is now uh, facing political pressure um, at a very difficult moment, um, to worries about political pressure at the food, at the FDA, at the Center for Disease Control, um, you know, it's in, it's in our minds, right? So we're thinking about agencies and agency heads and, and, and politics. Um, and uh, uh, so, so it's 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 in the four, um, but you know I'm going to be talking about um, something a little a little different from the influence of politics on on agencies. Although, as we'll see, hopefully at the end of my remarks, there is a there is a political economy story here. It is about politics in in, in the end. Um, but I'm going to focus on on algorithms, uh, not uh, necessarily on politics. Okay, um, and. The, the talk I'm gonna give uh, draws from um, uh, this, this work that I co-wrote with someone who I can't believe is actually uh, taking time out of her day to, to watch me talk about our paper, but Danielle Citrin, um, who is a uh, magical uh, force of nature and uh, you know, the leading person in, in multiple fields. And I hope that Danielle, you'll feel like you should jump in because this is your work. Um, <laughs> too. Uh, and so it's lovely, lovely to have you on here. But you can hear how I frame our paper to other people now from, from this. Yeah. Um, and so, um, and so, the, so, the, so the question that I'm taking up today has to do with, um, with the use of algorithms by governments. Now, the use of algorithms by governments is also in the news. Um, and it's in the news in a very specific way. So for example, I, I can't imagine that you've missed the um, protest by UK students, students in Wales um, and other parts of, of, you know, so students who have, who have protested in Europe, the use of algorithms to determine what their grade should be because the coronavirus is not making it possible to do the same kind of testing. And so they're, they're, they're using algorithms to anticipate what grades are gonna be. And um, they've been resoundingly criticized on a number of levels, but also specifically because um, as Virginia Eubanks would anticipate, as as many people would anticipate, um, they they disadvantage people of, of lower socioeconomic status. Um, so that was one of the complaints about them. And so you see these like literal bodies in the street, you know, people people uh, on the ground on campus uh, protesting the use of an algorithm 
uh, by a, a quasi, you know, by an institution in order to make decisions that are material to their lives. Um, you see it in, in the United States, you know, time and again, there's been a, a number of wonderful books uh, written about it. Algorithms of Oppression, for example, um, um, the, the, book I, the, the book I mentioned by, by Eubanks as well, um, uh, another book by um, uh, The Weapons of Math Destruction. There's been a, bu a bunch of, of discussions about algorithms, but very notably, we saw maybe the first instance or at least one of the first instances um, of uh, an individual actually being indicted as a result of facial recognition not working well. Um, uh, so that was uh, Robert Williams, who was, who was falsely arrested and even in, in, indicted on, uh, on the basis that, um, that uh, or at a minimum arrested on the basis that, he, that a system appeared to match him to as, as being at the scene of a crime. And of course it wasn't, it wasn't so. Um, and so we see that and it's highly, highly uh, uh, visible. Um, and so when you see headlines like these that talk about algorithms by used by the government, algorithms used by institutions, they tend to look a particular way. And the headlines say things like, government relying on algorithms that are biased and flawed. Okay, governments relying on, on algorithms that are biased and flawed. And the public at a minimum, and many, many scholars um, additionally, focus on the latter half of that sentence, that the algorithms are biased and flawed, okay? And that is incredibly important work, incredibly important work. I mean, the fact that these things are biased and flawed is hugely important. It's important at the individual level because of the ways in which they're affecting real people's lives and lived experiences. It's important at a, at a structural level because of the way in which algorithms um, uh, and automation uh, tend to reify and, and reinforce and amplify um, uh, racial and, and gender and other biases within, within our, our society. So it's very, very important work. But the work that, that um, uh, the emphasis of, of our paper, of Danielle and my paper, I think it's fair to say, um, is really on the former, right? Not that governments are turning to algorithms that are flies, that are biased and, 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 and flawed, right? But that they're turning to algorithms, that they're turning to algorithms. And governments turn to algorithms for a wide variety of reasons, some of which are perfectly understandable, right? Uh, that, that is to say, the mode, that, that they're addressing a, a, a real, a perception of a real problem. Even the sentencing algorithms, which have been so deeply problematic, um, even the, the, the bail algorithm, you know, the algorithms to determine um, whether you'll be detained prior to, to your um, defendant will be detained prior to their, their trial, even those you know, have, have reasons behind them that we might think of as actually being in some small ways noble. Now, embracing algorithms instead may have been a terrible mistake and isn't maybe or the wrong thing to do, but the, but the base motivation had to do with the idea that the bail system, because it privileged people who are able to come up with the resources to get themselves out of jail prior to having their, their, their court appearance, systematically um, affected vulnerable populations um, uh, uh, was, was racially um, uh, discriminatory, uh, was socioeconomically discriminatory, right? Um, in the case of, of administrative agencies, um, these big, you know, uh, uh, these big state and federal agencies, um, there also might be good reasons to turn to turn towards automation, or at least a perception that there is good reasons to do that. Um, but the point is that they're they're actually doing it. Um, you know, there was a recent study uh, at Stanford um, that looked at the plans for the federal government, and particularly for agencies. In fact, it was in um, cooperation with a. Um, uh, an, agency, uh, an agency within the federal government that actually studies administrative law. That's how interesting administrative law is, that there's a whole agency within the government and all they do all the time is study administrative law all the time. Um, and so, so they, they, they work together and they found that a huge percentage of agencies were either using, federal agencies were either using machine learning or, or, or experimenting with or considering using machine learning uh, within artificial intelligence. Um, and so that you, we may see a sort of wholesale um, a pivot towards, towards that, 
um, with mixed effects. Um, but you know what what Danielle and I know, and what many people on this on this uh, in this meeting know or in this uh, lecture know, um, is that is that agencies have been using automation for a long time. Okay, well before machine learning or even algorithm it was a household name, or a household word, right? They've been using it for a long time. Over over the last few decades, agencies, particularly state agencies, have been turning more and more to automation to carry out their functions in society, whether they're making decisions about who should get certain benefits or getting them, getting them taken away, they're making decisions about who should um, gain admittance to something, how people should be evaluated in terms of merit for their jobs, um, and so on and so on. Agencies are turning to automation and have been for decades and decades. So in, in many ways, you look at the Stanford study and it's a, it's a story about how like, hey, look, agencies are thinking about, are do, about doing AI um, and you know, you're, you're, maybe that's good, maybe that's bad, but it's happening. Um, you're sort of reminded of, um, I don't know if I'll get this exactly right because I don't have it in front of me, but I'm reminded of a, of a quote um, by one of my colleagues in computer science here at the University of Washington, uh, Pedro D Domingos, who in his book, uh, wrote that you know the problem with artificial intelligence is not um, that it's going to be too smart and take over, um, it's that it's too dumb and already has, right? Um, and so the basic idea here is that you know while we're watching to see how agencies are experimenting with this gee whiz bang new technology of artificial intelligence, you know we got to keep our eye on the fact that they have long deployed software and automation, especially in the state context, but not exclusively. I mean, there's also the no-fly list, for example, which is a federal program where reliance upon algorithms that affects people's liberty. Um, but you know, anyway, a lot is going on in the states. Um, and so, um, and you know, it, it, automation is not always a bad thing, right? I mean, so for example, I referenced the, um, you know, I referenced the postal service, like if it's an automated mail sorter, right, that like helps people do their job, maybe we shouldn't dismantle it right before we do mail-in voting, uh, if it's working perfectly well and helping, I mean, automation is not in intrinsically bad, um, but uh, automation used to make decisions about people's lives um, is, is, is and can be problematic. So um, the legal literature, and I'm really talking about the legal literature here for now, but the discourse in law has, long foregrounded the way in which automation by agencies um, interferes with um, process, with process. The process that is due um, by virtue of the constitution, by virtue of um, uh, federal law, particularly the uh, Administrative Procedure Act, you know, Lawyers uh, were obsessed with process at one level, and and so what 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 many people um, looked at or have been looking at is the way in which automation, when you substitute a, a system, a, a computer system or an algorithm for what a person used to do, that in a sort of classic law and, uh, law and technology way, that substitution then. Um, uh, causes a, a, a breakdown of the requisite safeguards that we put in place for our values, okay? Um, and so you see that in literature dating back decades, okay? So you see that, for example, when Danielle and I were, were researching our, our paper, we found examples, you know, from Paul Schwartz from the 1990s. And of course, Danielle herself has two papers in the same year, you know, now um, uh, 15, 10, 15 years ago, um, I think those papers are in 2008. Can I get a nod? Yeah, okay. So in, in 2008, writing about this phenomenon and technological due process, for example, which is just required reading in, in our field, um, Danielle describes the ways in which, um, in which uh, uh, the shift to automation, the shift to algorithms um, has displaced safeguards for everything from, you know, uh, rulemaking, like making new rules and having public participation, uh, that has been sort of um, uh, sublimated into software in a way that is hard to pick apart and hard to challenge. Um, to individual decisions, to the constitutional you're, guarantees you're supposed to get before material benefits are taken away from you and so on. And she showed very elegantly 
uh, all the ways in which our safeguards have fallen away or been eroded. And she came up with a number of um, very helpful ways to address this deficit, okay? Um, and in addition to Danielle's work, I mean, Danielle's work in a, in a sense has sort of spawned this cottage industry around thinking about, about process and automation, right? So you see wonderful work by Kate Crawford and Jason Schultz. Um, you see, um, uh, and, and you know any number of papers I could I could point you to where, where there is a, a very thick you know creative rigorous discussion of the way in which process has been interrupted by automation and can be restored. Okay, um, and that too is incredibly important. Incredibly important. Now, in recent years, in sort of other disciplines, in addition to law, but in an interdisciplinary conversation. Um, on fairness, accountability, and transparency. We've also seen um, computer scientists, statisticians, um, people in the humanities, critical scholars, and others interrogating algorithms, but still focusing on that, um, you know, on, on that, that part of the headline, the flaws and the biases. And some people have been making really important moves saying, you know, um, it's not just about whether the algorithm works or doesn't work or doesn't work for this population or does. It's about who, who is, is being put under the lens of, of algorithms, who, is, who are they being brought to bear to affect, right? People are, are making these more systemic moves about, you know, who are we subjecting to algorithms and why and sort of ideas. And, and isn't the deeper problem structural racism or isn't the deeper problem um, uh, structural sexism and the like. Um, but there's this whole discourse now that's blossoming around, um, around unpacking notions of fairness and accountability and bias and the like, um, and, and sort of what to do about it. And it's a fascinating conversation and, and there's an annual conference um, around that if you're interested. Um, but again, in the legal discourse, you know, the way we've been interacting with that has again been around looking for, you know, we're lawyers, we're looking for laws, you know, we're looking for things like, um, I think of like Solon Baracus as Andrew Selps's work on this disparate impact, for example, you know, or um, uh, um, uh, 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 you know, work um, in the um, employment context about employment discrimination, um, which I can I can link to you. But the but the point is is that you know we have um, been focusing on the law. So what Danielle and I are focusing on finally um, is not again process, but legitimacy. Okay, and this is your warning that this is where a f there's going to be a few minutes of administrative law. So if you, if this, if, if you need to shut your um, <laughs> sound off for a minute, ah, you know, that's really wise to record the meeting right when I'm about to talk about administrative law. I can see why you did that. You're like, wait, he's talking about administrative law? Well, I'm going to record this. This has got to be recorded. That's, that's right. That's how awesome administrative law is. Um, okay, so, so. Um, you know, the, the whole idea of, um, of